Hey, hey, this is Scott. So I am starting a new YouTube playlist on Bayesian methods um, and, and some other topics like causation. And so I'll show you where to find that in, in just a minute. But um, I'm going to be adding a lot to this, this playlist. This is really an experiment. So I would appreciate any feedback. Some of this stuff is going to be, you know, very basic. Some of it will have some theory to it. Some of it will be hands-on. Um, in this particular one, I'm not going to actually get into um, an interactive session. I'm going to show you some code and Pi MC3. Um, but I'm thinking about maybe showing things in R, Python, uh, et cetera, hands-on. So if you provide comments, uh, that will help direct me with the series. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So um, again, this is just a very basic linear regression um, example um, using uh, Bayes methods. So just as a quick review, if you look at Bayes theorem, um, it's it's right there, right? It's, it's sometimes described as reverse probability rule. So, um, and then we'll get into the combination of Bayes the application of Bayes' theorem, which is to use prior information with data combined to, to develop a posterior distribution. But this is Bayes', Bayes theorem in, in a nutshell. So um, here, what we're going to have here is A is uh, rain, the event of rain, and B is the event of clouds, right? So the probability of rain given clouds is the probability of clouds given rain times the probability of rain divided by the probability of, of, of a cloud. So we're essentially trying to answer this question right here. What is the chance it rains given it is cloudy? Right? What is the chance of rain given that it's cloudy? These are conditional. Um, probabilities. So if we say that the, the, the chance that it's, it's cloudy given rain is one half and in general the probability of rain is one tenth and in general the probability that it's cloudy is 0.4 then if it is um, uh, cloudy the probability that rain is 0.125. So you can see it, it increased from essentially 10% to 12.5% um, based on whether we don't know anything about whether it's cloudy or not, or we do know it's, it's cloudy. So anyway, very simple, very simple example. Okay, so there are trade-offs between um, Bayesian statistics and traditional what, what's called classical or uh, frequentist models. And by the way, I, I'm doing a whole series going through basically a, a course in what this is. And that, that is all about the theory um, behind um, Bayesian statistics and, and covering the full, full gamut there um, from the very simple all the way through. So it'd be like a, an undergrad class in, in Bayesian stats. But in general, the, the, the pros of Bayesian statistics is it incorporates this prior information, right? So we often know we have a lot of human experience. Um, if you're a researcher, you have a lot of experience in a field. Um, so why not use that information in, um, as, as a basis? And then we can add data to that. Um, in an experiment, combine those two, and, and that's the power uh, of Bayesian statistics. So the other thing is it provides interpretable um, answers, the second bullet right here, um, meaning that we can speak in true terms of probability. A lot of people talk about uh, confidence intervals, <laughs> and uh, those, those are really not probabilities. That's a repeated uh, sampling paradigm, so those are not the probabilities, but Bayesian provides true probabilities in the end, which we'll see in just a second. Um, it's also very convenient for hierarchical models. So if you have, you know, a structure, you can 
can use Bayesian methods to um, fill in, especially for, for gaps and everything, if you're missing data, um, that, that is uh, uh, one thing that, that you can do as well. So some of the cons, um, you know, how do you choose a prior? And there are methods, and I, I could even do uh, a session on that, elicitation uh, techniques for uh, uh, eliciting Bayesian priors. And then, um, you know, in the science community, there is some argument over priors. Uh, some people say that Bayesian methods um, are subjective in nature. It turns out all probability is, is subjective, so see my other series on that. Um, and then Bayesian inference combines different sources of information. So, in other words, you don't, you, you're not conducting straight from a population of data. Um, you are incorporating this other set of data, and so where are the results coming from? Are they coming from the prior? Are they coming from the experiment? And there's some ways to try to quantify that as well. The, the last piece is they're computationally intensive. That's the reason that they were not very widely used previously, but um, quite honestly, that has been overcome quite a bit, um, so that's enabling more and more Bayes computation. So. Again, we, we were talking about updating uh, beliefs based on new information, and so one of the really cool things about Beige is, is the updating of priors. So you start with the non-informative, well, you can start with a, a prior or a non-informative prior, and you can update that information um, with the data and uh, get a new prior. So that would be a combination of the, the say a non-informative prior and, and the data itself and then you just continue to learn um, so you're not throwing away data every time you're actually updating uh, updating things and the other thing is that you know when you add data um, you decrease the width of the posterior distribution right so um, again the posterior is a combination of the prior plus the experimental data and um, the more data you have, the, the uh, posterior really starts to hone in on, um, just like a confidence, confidence interval, if you have more and more data um, in a confidence interval, that uh, kind of does the same thing. The confidence interval width goes down. All right, so just a quick, a couple comments on Markov chain Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo itself, the history of that was actually in uh, World War II, the development of the atomic bomb. Um, if you're a, a math person, um, you know in integral calculus, the way you estimate a, um, a volume um, or an area under a curve is through integral calculus. And so what if you have a function that is non-specified um, or a function that is intractable and you cannot use calculus to figure out what the volume or the area is? Monte Carlo allows for that. And the basic idea here is generating random numbers. Um, and let me just mark this up a little bit. So what we do is we specify an, a volume that we know it, uh, it, I'm sorry, an area outside of the volume that we want to estimate. So that's the square right here. And then we estimate the, um, we have the volume in consideration and we start throwing random darts at it. And, and in this example, you can see that 19 of the 25 random darts fell inside our volume that we're interested in and then uh, six fell out of the area that we're interested in. So we know, since we encapsulated this thing in something that we know, we know the volume of that, and then we can use simple ratio of the number of darts that landed inside versus the total number of, of dots, and we know what the proportion of, of that uh, beginning area was. So that's the Monte Carlo piece. And then the Mar uh, Markov chain piece is, and by the way, we're doing this so because there's uh, the, the Bayesian methods are, are often intractable. There's no closed form, it's called closed form mathematically, um, unlike frequentist statistics like, you know, the, the formula for standard deviation or um, uh, anyway, uh, maximum likelihood estimation. So uh, here the 
the Markov chain essentially is these transition states. So just as an example, like if you are sleeping, the probability you're going to go from sleeping to hunting is 0.8. The probability that you're going to um, eat next is 15%, and the probability that you're going to stay in that, that state with no transition is 0 0.05. So that's kind of the way the, the, the Markov uh, chain piece works. Okay, so let's go in and, and look at a linear um, regression example. So uh, you're probably familiar with this, right? So equation with the frequency translation, um, y is, is a function of the intercept alpha plus the slope beta uh, x sub i. And then if we um, want to con constrain um, priors, right, we, we can have a prior that's essentially um, alpha is normal, 0, 1. Uh, beta is a half normal to 0, 1. And the, the error is uniform, 0 to 10. All right? And then what we can do is we can take that information for the prior information, and then we're going to use this data model for heights uh, and you can find this data right here. Here's the the uh, URL for, for this. And then, and you can see this, this data right here. Um, it's just a snapshot um, ahead and the tail um, of the data set itself. Here's the distribution um, as well. And then if we get into it, we'll see that um, we can apply um, this this uh, Pi MC3 uh, library. So you can go out. Uh, in fact, here it is right here. The the URL is right here. Um, and so it's it's a pretty prominent. Uh, if you're using Python, there are other R packages as well. But if you're using Python, it, it's a it's a very uh, popular package. And so just trying to demonstrate some of the uh, the code here so the priors we're modeling three priors um, so the intercept itself alpha um, so the the average is 150 we're, we're modeling with a, a normal distribution standard deviation of 100 the uh, slope we're modeling with a normal distribution um, with uh, Average zero, standard deviation of ten, and then the uniform. We are um, modeling the the errors as uniform, uh, sigma zero to to fifty, and then the model itself. We're using that uh, HAL data that we just looked at, right? And we're using the combination there. So the probability model is we're using the, a deterministic model for the um, for the uh, combination of intercept plus the, the slope, the actual y value itself. And then we're modeling the, the height here um, as um, uh, with, with that same data. And then we're doing 500 iterations. And when we do that, we come up with these posteriors. So the top posterior right here is for alpha on the intercept itself, right? And then the posterior for the slope is this right here. Interesting kind of um, curves here. And then sigma, uh, the, the error right here uh, as well. And then the overall estimate of the combination is here. Also, um, as part of the output, you know, here's the, the actual point estimates, but then we have these um, highest density intervals. These are somewhat like confidence intervals, but they're true probabilities. They're, they're no longer a repeated sampling paradigm. They're, they're actually um, a probability with bounds, right? So the slope is bounded by 0.83 to 0.98. And so this is a 94% um, inclusion um, high, highest density interval, right? There's 3% in each tail. And then um, 
yeah, so I think that's all I'm going to cover here. Um, again, I could do um, more R. I could I, I, um, I have different degrees of freedom here, so just let me know what you think. Um, if you want to look at the overall playlist that I have on YouTube, just type in my name, Scott Burke, and then um, this is the playlist that I'm creating. And again, this the hands-on is, is one piece. I'm doing, covering some theories and other stuff. So I hope you found that meaningful. Thanks.